Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 598. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is May 22nd, 2020. All right, welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted. Did you notice the number 598? We're way up there again, and we'll never run out of numbers if you believe in infinity, and I do. And we're coming up on 600. If you guys remember, some of you guys are new to the audience, back in episode 500, we offered, hey, if you guys want to say hi and record little video clips and say, uh, I'm so-and-so watching from so-and-so place, and I love the show, you can send those clips to us. You can send it to anglicantv at gmail.com, or you can uh, upload it to G, uh, your g drive your google drive and send me a link and we would like to include those in episode 500 uh it was 500 episode 600 it was a lot of fun in 500 and i kind of want to repeat that before we get too far i want you to like the episode share the episode this last episode 598 was the most shared episode in in the last 100 and really appreciate that uh comment you guys are the best commenters Every week, George and I say we need to talk about the comments. What do we forget to do every week, George? Talk about the comments. Talk. <laughs> we get towards the end. That's such a great show. What do you want to do? Cut. Go. Go. Get, cut it. Stop. We, we, we're ending on a high note, you know. So we often miss the comments. Please subscribe if you've not subscribed, and if you have not and do not know, we have a podcast. You will find the link to the podcast in the show notes so you can just listen to us on your car radio on the way to work which you don't work right now on your way to what the, the kitchen table where you set up your laptop for work all right let's move a little bit on to the news before we do that george how you been doing this week kevin i'm gonna need vacation once the shutdown's over yes. it has been an ass- we're now doing elective surgeries again in florida i'm not myself no, but no. uh so i went in and i had uh I have a big hole in my back, so I'm sitting in a wooden chair, pressed against the bandage, pressed against the uh, the, the harsh back. The dermatologist? Uh, uh, yes, the skin. Yeah. In Florida, when yes. when you move here, uh, you hit 55, they give you a small white dog and a season pass at the dermatologist to start slicing off skin cancer spots. And I had a lovely little thing taken out of the small of my back the other day. And, oh. But it's... We had Ascension Day yesterday. Now, most Episcopal parishes, Ascension Day, since it's a Thursday, that conflicts with bridge and mahjong and golf, so you don't do anything. Well, we had an Ascension Day service that had the most viewership of any service I can recall in a long time. There must be nothing on TV these days where Ascension Day services from Lacanto, Florida get great ratings. No, same here. We uh, had Ascension Day services at our church first time ever and we broadcast it to the world people are watching and we blew bubbles and we had a great service it was a lot of fun and i've i've never done an ascension service myself either i'm like we got to add this to the repertoire it was a lot of fun where's the blowing bubbles part comes in i'm not certain i remember oh, that oh no, that- yeah, if it's not in there you need to add it but that's part of the ascension oh. we blew bubbles at the very end it was a lot of fun so Oh. Uh, I, I'm okay. a 55 year old who enjoyed <laughs> blowing bubbles. How sad is that? So, oh. but you mentioned there's nothing good on TV, and that's so right. There's no more uh, Archie and Edith. There's no more Irving Lives Raymond or The Cosby Show. There's nothing compelling for people to sit and watch on NBC or CBS or ABC. There used to be, you know, times where there was just you don't miss TV. And those days are largely over. The 70s and 80s, 90s was a time where at least once a week, my family would tune into some show that we were addicted to. And I don't think, I can't think of anything that's not, you know, cable related or Netflix related, maybe some HBO series that people are, okay, Game of Thrones would be the lot, the, the, the addicted one. That's kind of an adultish. You know, there's just no compelling family TV anymore, George. It's very true. Uh, drama sports comedy you can't comment you can't be funny on tv anymore no. uh do you think uh, 
Susan and I uh, discovered Seinfeld in reruns a little a few years after it was on, and we would watch those. And I was we watched one the other night, and uh, some of the jokes you could not say. be done today. <laughs> no, not at all. And in, fact, in some respects, it makes them even funnier because <laughs> it's it's dangerous. Uh, Jerry and George Costanza and Kramer and Elaine are dangerously edgy comics. They weren't at the time, but in today's PC culture, they're right out there where I'm surprised they're not being pilloried or uh, well they have been jerry uh, Sp uh springer uh Sp seinfeld jeez had complained about that recently said we can't do comedy anymore because everybody's offended we have created an offended generation so i can't do my edgy funny jokes i can't draw people uh into an audience uh, situation where we have six, seven hundred people laugh at my jokes because a lot of them have been trained to be offended. They haven't been trained to laugh at themselves. Mm -hmm. They they don't understand what humor is anymore. And I think that's a, a large port of port, a large part of what's missing uh, in our in our current situation. People can't laugh at themselves, and it, it's sad to watch. Let's move on to the news. Uh, got, I think, two or three quick stories. Well, uh, actually, it's yeah. true about this show. Whenever we make fun of Mormons or Catholics or Calvinists <laughs> or, or Anglicans, you would, or Anglicans, you would think that we had set a hot fire poker against somebody's heart. I mean, uh, uh, I, it's okay. If I were not an IT person, I would probably be a, a stand up comedian. I love comedy. I love jokes. I love making people laugh. I I love the the facial response of a good belly laugh that I caught. I thought you started out as a disc jockey. I thought that was your first job. That was, but it was there's no career in that, especially oh. with how how the songs kept getting worse. Tell that to Howard Stern. <laughs> yeah, so oh, jeez. <laughs> I, I remember the day that I decided, uh, you know, being a, a disc jockey is not for me. And there was a song called Sex Me Up. And uh, it was released sometime in the uh, mid 90s. And it was the hottest thing in middle school and high schools. And all these young girls and boys were uh, grinding each other at parties. And I'm like, that it's it's over this is not a an edible way to make a, a career so i went into it hey it worked um let's talk about uh how the church of england is supporting the sex you up culture apparently i read a story posted on anglican inc and i'll bring it up over here real quick oops that's not it i shall bring it up technology is it gonna come up that didn't come up there we go so on Anglican Inc, I have the story, Church of England Secondary School Assigns Preteens Pornographic Homework. George, I think that's very odd in the, in the Christian day and age that we would be doing that, but what you, do, you posted the story, you wrote the story, what happened? Well, it was a local news item from the, da the Hull Daily Mail. Mm -hmm. Hull is a city on the northeast coast of England, and one of our friends and contributors, Melvin Tinkers, the rector Tinkers, of the sir. biggest sure. Anglican church in Hull. Well, the Archbishop St. Tomo Academy, that's why there's the picture of Archbishop St. Tomo with the school children and the headmaster on the article. I took it from their website. It's a uh, secondary school, which is uh, the equivalent in America of a middle school, 11 to 14 year olds. They're like most British schools on shutdown, lockdown. They're having distance educations. They're doing things online. And their equivalent of our health instruction or sex education, uh, their department assigned the young children sex education homework. And they were basically assigned, assigned lessons and asked to define pornography, bondage, anal sex, transgenderism. You just go on and on and on and on and on and basically asked to do their homework about these deviant sexual practices. Oh, so they were supposed to search Google and find out more. Is that what? <laughs> well, no. well it, didn't, it didn't say, now look up anal sex on the internet and uh... tell us what you find. But what does it mean? And 11-year-olds on the internet doing their homework asked to look up stuff about anal sex what are they going to find mm -hmm. now there's a silver lining in all this the parents at this school 
went ballistic. Thank God. They, they said, how could you be? My 11-year-old has Hello Kitty pillowcases and still believes in unicorn and fairies, and you're sending her in to look up hardcore sexual practices. Now, Archbishop Zemtamu is a Church of England school. I, in the article, we printed part of its mission statement. It is to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ, model his life and living, and follow all... The, there are no buzzwords in this school. It's not some hippy-dippy East Village school where uh, you sit around, uh, listen to gurus. <laughs> it's a normal church school. It's a Catholic, It's the equivalent of American parochial school. Well, now, it's the type of school I sent my all three of my kids to uh, all the way through high school. My kids went to the Roman Catholic parochial school where I knew that they were not going to be indoctrinated by the most liberal ideas available in America because the public schools here really teach some horrible dogma about it's basically all taught by the people who survived the sexual revolution you know well, this, and I well, tried to avoid that well you, you get what you pay for you <laughs> don't get what you pay, you pay for, for that's, that's the right. problem huh? the well the, the parents blew up and the and the headmaster the principal apologized for signing this work said lessons will be learned from now on we're only going to provide age equivalent age appropriate education and we'll alert the parents next time we do something why do you need to alert the parents next time you're going to do something if you're not going to do it again but that's another question so he basically said i'm sorry i know this is wrong but he then went on to say but in our defense of the uh, health education department we are only doing what the government guidelines tell us it's appropriate to do see here's a, here's a kicker the church of england should be bringing jesus christ to the people of england instead it's a it's an agent of the government so that it uses stonewall the gay advocacy militant gay advocacy group to help advise it on its sex education curriculums so that the Archbishop of Canterbury may say, well, the Church of England hasn't changed its liturgy and it's our teaching, sexual, moral, morality, and purity. Well, what it's doing in its own schools is using the most, the loudest lobbyists of the deviant culture to form 11-year-olds and 12-year-olds and 13-year-olds. Well, the, and this is what Stonewall thinks is age-appropriate. This is what the public school system in England thinks is appropriate. 11 year olds should be learning about this type of thing just in case they want to find out. It's better they find out from the schools than from the streets or their friends. Come on, George. Well, from a pastoral perspective, I have, I've had to deal with young, almost all young boys, young boys, 12, 13, 14 years old, uh, who basically are addicted to pornography. Yeah. And well, yes, that's naughty. Don't do that. But it goes even further because what it is doing is warping their understanding of women, of what love is, of what affection is, of the purpose of the body, the purpose of sexuality, so that these young boys are basically being corrupted and polluted and poisoned. They're not sexually promiscuous. They're not sexually active. But they're getting on the Internet when their parents are asleep and looking at these things and then they're looking at their little girl classmates and they're thinking that's what these girls want because that's what the girls want in these videos. Yeah. Ironically, sadly, pornography makes women into objects. The one thing we've been told for the last 40 years by the liberation feminist movement, we're not objects. Well, they support pornography and pornography makes women and girls objects. You're back to it, square one. And the, the, neuro, the neuro, neuroscientist tell us it rewires your brain it, yeah, absolutely. in other words it changes how your thought processes work and so on one level melvin tinker uh sent us some very good comments for the article and i encourage you to read the story on anglican inc especially for melvin's uh bit at the end so, in other words melvin speaks of the abdication responsibility of the teachers of saying well we're there's appointed experts on sex or on these government forums and committees. Therefore, we're going to do what they say. Whereas we have the clear, t how does that square with the church's mission of proclaiming Jesus Christ and making it part of the lives of the children? Where, you know, 
this is fake Christianity. This is the Church of England at its very worst, meaning as an exemplar of the culture rather than a change agent bringing Christ into the culture. Indeed. All right, another Church of England story. And sadly, all the news is over the Church of England uh, uh, this week, but that's just reality. Uh, we have a couple commenters talk more about the Episcopal Church. Strangely, the Episcopal Church just isn't making the news a lot lately, so we're stuck with some bigger stories, at least this week, uh, from the Church of England. Kevin, I told you that when Catherine Jeffrey Shorey retired, uh, we, we did, were just yeah. going to take a hit. Uh, I am surprised we have any viewership at all after Catherine Jeffrey Shorey. Um, what? What is CNN going to do when jo Donald Trump finishes his presidency? What, it's what? All <laughs> no, I mean, can they get true. mad at, at, at uh, huh? Mike Pence the way they can? I mean, come on now. Rachel Maddow's career is over after Trump. I mean, it, it, it's a sad reality. Um, they've lost their greatest enemy. But in the same Their greatest asset. Their greatest asset. Let's talk quickly about. Um, the camp system that used to exist in the, the 60s and 70s and 80s, 90s, up until a couple of weeks ago, uh, it goes within the, the church. goes back to the 40s. Yeah, the 40s, the, the Irwin, Irwin camps. And this is where a lot of people went to camp and had a wonderful time and were ministered to. And this is the same camps where a lot of people went to camp and were abused in uh, sadistic and sometimes sexual ways. And now those camps are no more, George. You may have heard them referred to as BASH, B-A-S-H camps, right. after its founder, Nash. I forget his first name, Alfred or Albert. Well, these were invitation-only camps for boys attending the most prestigious private schools, or public schools, as they're called in England, who would be invited to be basically to these summer camps and to be uh, in fostered and initiated in the evangelical Christian culture. And most uh, people from John Stott uh, or Dickie Gumbel of Alpha fame, mm -hmm. Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, a who's who of the evangelical upper classes, their boys passed through these camps. And for many of them, for most of them, it was a wonderful, life-changing, affirming experience, just like, you know, how the Boy Scouts can be for people. Unfortunately, these camps also attracted perverts. We uh, had the ongoing saga of John Smythe. The, uh, he was a QC, a, a Queen's Council, uh, a top flight attorney. Uh, uh, one of the leaders of these camps would invite boys uh, to his home from Winchester College, which is one of the top private schools. And boys he had met in these summer camps and he would beat them, he'd flagellate them. It was all part of a, deep, a deviant, sexual, homoerotic culture. We have all the nonsense uh, around Jonathan Fletcher, but it really was the Smythe issue. Yeah, it was mostly Smythe at the camps. Um, but Smythe do uh, had to flee England. He got, basically, get out of the country before you get arrested. Went to the way, ran some camps there did the same stuff, went to South Africa, and finally died of a heart attack. And it was an open secret of his being an abuser. And recently the lawsuits began. And they've, you were in, it's spelled, for those of you who don't know the oddities of English pronunciation, um, they were, if you look down to the second paragraph, you have the I were in camps. Well, evidently in England, they pronounce the I as a U, and they don't pronounce the W, so it's U in camps. They uh, have basically bit the bullet, and they just did a settlement with three bo three men who were abused as children for 100,000 pounds, and they probably spent as much again in legal fees. Uh, that And there are hundreds of victims. So essentially, they so the writing was on the wall, and they're basically liquidating uh, the corporate shell the English to, uh, to escape the bankruptcy. liability that is yeah. going to arise. Yeah, the English equivalent of bankruptcy, you know, and so. But it, yeah. it wasn't so, it, it, you know, it's just like we saw the Boy Scouts in the United States go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. um, 
to declare bankruptcy to forestall being wiped out by the uh, abuse by the acts of a few bad Boy Scout masters. Uh, and what is so very sad is that for every thousand thoughtful, courageous, wonderful Boy Scout leaders, men who gave their lives to help young men and boys uh, be the best they could be and install wonderful values. You've got these handful of perverts who basically found themselves with no other supervision with young boys whom then they can then sexually abuse or and in each of these organizations, whether it's the Boy Scouts or the UN camps or private schools in the United States or Catholic schools, uh, it's, uh, the devil is around us all the time. And it's the same, in some respects, it's the same issue that this Archbishop Sentamu Academy faces of the leadership basically going along to get along, not basically calling out bad acts until it's too late and the parents blow up when they find that their children are being abused. In the Archbishop Semtamu uh, case, they weren't being physically abused, but they were being psychologically and emotionally abused by being led to pornography by their own school. In the well, UN camps, they were being abused physically and emotionally by John Smythe. And it took the parents and it took a new generation to say, stop. But here's the thing. They're only saying stop in the Christian school. Here in America, in the liberal uh, public schools, in England, in the public schools, around the world in the public schools, the Stonewall strategy is taking place. And they're being taught at young ages, as young as kindergartens, they're having story time with um, what, uh, drag queens. Drag queens. Um, and they're, they're initiating and starting as early as possible to let them know that this is normal. These people yeah, are I, normal. There's nothing wrong with, you know, using fruit to uh, cause your genitals to have you know, some type of excited feeling. Don't worry about it. it. It's the same mindset that we had in some U.S. states where we have a lockdown. And I knew this because I, I, uh, I needed to get these skin cancers off. Uh, uh, and I couldn't for three months or two and a half months because and well and good. Well, if I had lived in Michigan, if I lived in Michigan and I needed these things done, I'd still be waiting. But if, if my child wanted an abortion, she could walk in and get one tomorrow. Yeah. In other words, what is health care? Uh, it you know the, the 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 special interests allow abortions, but they prevent knee surgeries or skin cancer surgeries or tests for cancer or initiation to chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. The, I don't want to say pervert culture, but the, we're so out of, out, out of the round, out of, out of kilter in our world today, where there are certain protected practices uh, that are amoral, are immoral and damaging and destructive. And self perpetuating. And they're by the state and they're actually promoted by the state. Yeah. But like what happened at the urine camps was self-perpetuating. If you are abused, you are extremely more likely to be an abuser in the future. It's just the it's the nature of abuse. We, you know, that we identified uh, in our researches and writing five abusers. Uh, one has died. Smith has died, and you know, three others went on to be uh, prep school teachers and uh, basically moved back into this world into the society where. They were abused as small boys, and they're going and on to teach and the leaders in these same institutions and carrying on the same behaviors. Mm. I, I don't. I, I'm not a psychologist. I don't understand how these things arise, but I think you're right, Kevin. I think part of it is learned behavior. Yeah. It's what these little boys in Lacanto, Florida, are learning when, when they watch pornography. That's how they learn to express themselves sexually. If you're a little boy and you're sexually abused and your innocence is taken away and corrupted, are you more likely to do that when you're a man placed in that same position with other young boys? Such a happy show. Six hundred will be much better. Five ninety nine. We had to get all the crap of the Church of England out there. Let you know about it. Maybe in the six hundred we'll talk about the Episcopal Church and the ACNA again with happy talk. But, but here's here's the happy point, uh, yeah. if I if I may. Oh, absolutely. 
the parents stood up and said, this shall not, they weren't sheep. They and weren't they were, But they weren't they shamed were, either. Nobody they shamed them. They weren't ashamed to speak yeah. out. They yeah. weren't sheep. Uh, these aren't, the Archbishop Samtamo Academy, it's a lovely school. I'm sure it does very well, but, but it's not attracting the upper classes of Hull. They send their children off to other schools. This is the uh, people scrape and save to send their kids to these better schools, give them a chance in life. And usually the world ignores parents like that. They well, don't they care do. what they It's have to not do. only that, George, but if a, a person going to a public school had a parent that stood up and said, we can't have this type of teaching in our schools, it's horrible, they would be accused of a hate crime. You hate the LGTBs because you won't allow this type of teaching at, in eighth grade or eight, eight year olds. What are you, you're a hater. You're, you're a homophobe, you're, you know, how dare you? Well, it, you know, in, in some states, the United States, where they have these drag queen story hours, the schools have very strict rules about people with sex crimes uh, may not work at the school as janitors. They may not teach, but they're involved. But there, there's a carve out, an exception for queen story time. Yeah. So yeah. you can be a registered sex offender and still be permitted to lead five year olds in stories about drag queens uh, because there's a carve out for those people. What? All right. In other words, how sick is this world? We're very sick. That's why. <laughs> that's why we need the church. We need a church that won't hide, uh, hide away and cower when there's a pandemic. George, let's close out the program. Remember, people, please send us your little video clips of who you are, where you are, and what you think of the program. Those who think highly of the program are very likely to get their uh, clips on the air. Anything else? So AnglicanTV at gmail.com is how to send links to us. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 509 of Anglican Unscripted.